Good evening, everyone. My name is Linda Jackson, and it's been a wee while since we've done a poet's time, but spring's definitely coming now, and we're hoping COVID's well behind us. We've done, we started these poets times during COVID, give people a chance to share their work. But it's been nice as well when someone's got maybe something new to share to have a wee session again um, before the live session. And my guest today is a wonderful poet, actually, who's not getting the recognition I think she deserves. She's a brilliant poet. And this book uh, is called Clotter. What a cover it has, but the contents are equally wonderful. This is a Clotter, a collection of poems by Linda Devlin, who's my guest beside me here today. Hi, Linda, how are you doing? Hi, Linda. I'm doing great. Good. Mm. So, um, yeah, Linda and I have worked together in our work. This is obviously a, a Seahorse Publications book, but I've been looking at Linda's work for a long time. And I approached her. She was a bit surprised. Why would you be surprised when you're writing poetry like you do, Linda? Do you know? I don't know. I think it's when you've had a career in something else, that you do assume that that's your career. Um, and so when you stop doing that career, you're sort of floundering around, wondering what the next steps are. Um, and at my stage in life, you're given a freedom as well in that you can dispense with the idea of having to pay your mortgage or having to keep up a lifestyle, you know, that and really do what you want to do. So I guess it was just, you know, like if you do what you want to do, what would that be? And so for me, it was starting to write poetry. Um, and had you written poetry when you were younger or anything like that? I had written poems when I was at primary school and I'd written a poem about spring, actually. Um, and my granny found it um, and sent it to the Sunday Post. Um, and the Sunday Post published it. <laughs> so that was my very first publication. And you didn't uh, know then to go into that career? But goodness, I, I went to school in Pollock, Linda. I wasn't encouraged any kind of thing. We thought if we, were, we would make it to be a teacher, that that would be the excellence of being the middle class. Um, I think that, <laughs> you know, that you were taught to behave, you weren't taught to create. <laughs> yeah, and I, well, I think I think I, I, I know that, but thank goodness you found it when you did, um, because it's been bountiful for the rest of us to be able to look in and dip into the book. As I say, I went back to it this week and I've just so thoroughly enjoyed so many of the poems. But um, I'm going to hand over to Linda now, um, everyone, and she's going to read a couple of her poems for you. So this is Linda Devlin. I'm going to read this one's called I Am Sylvia Plath's Irish Maid. Um, and this came from me when I was in my 20s. I loved Sylvia Plath. I loved everything that she wrote. And I read everything I could get my hands on. And then I can't remember whether it was in the diaries or the letters home, but somewhere in this, there was a reference to her getting a cleaner and she couldn't afford to get an English cleaner because they were too expensive. So she decided that she would get an Irish cleaner because they were cheaper and they worked harder. So immediately I started um, to identify with the Irish maid um, and went really off um, Sylvia Plath for, for a good long while. So when I started to write the poem, um, I wrote a bit of it in that, that feeling, I'm the Irish maid that's um, mood. But then I started to think, but I must have loved something about her poetry. So I did then go back to thinking about what was it about it that made me love it so much. So this is a poem in response to that. I never look in a mirror unless to clean yours. Let me tell you, I know about social restrictions. I was not born to clean. My genius is undiscovered. The distance between us is greater than your comet. Your school did not teach cleaning sinks or laundering shirts. My dad was an item, but no monster to be slain and hurt. But oh, the way you open doors into dreams would have shot resolute black shoes. You, like a panther in the wind, pouring out love that no man or none can subdue. Allowing nothing to impede your primal right to feel and speak and baring your teeth kiss till there's red blood dripping on his cheek. You got it right. 
This is the only life we'll ever have. And there's no spiritual reward or redemption in housework. The other poem that I was going to read was um, The Glasgow Girls. And I had a friend um, staying at the, at the weekend and we went to Kelvin Grove and everybody knows about the Glasgow boys. So she was asking about the Glasgow boys and then said, but what, what happened to the, the, the Glasgow girls? And, I, and there were Glasgow girls and I had written about those Glasgow girls. Um, and so this is my, my poem about the Glasgow girls who were the artists um, of, of their time as much as the Glasgow boys were. They are the mad dreamers, wild, wonderful women, painting through chauvinism with colour and zest, enlightening spirits, their golden light streaming through them, shining on firebrands everywhere. Too hot to handle for some, as to touch them is to touch the red hot sun as a living being. Laughing away notions of withheld gratifications, they live in their visions with no rules or misogyny. They paint ripe passions in fierce reds and turquoise, complete with their hungry menstrual tension. Resolute, illuminate deep thoughts, freedom in undiscovered objects. Familiar landscapes awake, beauty is now on earth. Salacious mountains dip inside private blue waters. Going their own chosen way, they take rich delight when reaching into only their version of self. Through this transient land with its transgressive upheavals, do we not all need the light of the Glasgow girls? Wow. What a poem that is. What a poem that is, Linda. I just love it. I love the colours. I love the light that's beaming out of it and also this complete like feminist uh, demand, you know, um, for recognition from now to then, but them actually taking their own place. I loved all that when you said we shine on fire brands everywhere and that the to touch them is to touch the red hot sun as a living being. So it's all that colour. Oh my heavens. And I love that line complete with her hungry menstrual tension. It's not angry either. It's not an angry poem. Um, I loved it. I love the sounds of it and I love the colours of it. So um, you talk in here about the wonderful wild dreamers, mad dreamers, and you talked about the first poem about opening the door to dreams. Are you a dreamer? Oh Are yeah, I'm a dreamer. I love to live in my head and live in my dreams, and um, that's basic. That's basically what art is about, isn't it? Literature, you know, like that's that's your safeguard in the world is be able to enter into other worlds, um, and it makes the world that you're part of a bit more livable. And and when, um, you, when you introduced your friend to the Glasgow Girls, did you let her hear this poem? No, no, I hadn't actually brought the book with me, but she's got a copy of the um, of, of the book, so she can look it up herself when she goes. <laughs> so do you think there has been, obviously, you you taught this poem as a, I think it's a, the Glasgow Girls is a poem that would inspire any Glasgow girl, I think, and um, through this transient land with its transgressive upheavals, we all need the light, we all need the Glasgow Girls. So obviously when you're saying all your life you like reading Sylvia Plath, you know, do you think um, women still need role models of this kind to go forward? Oh, I do. Um, and sometimes I think we're going forward and then sometimes I think we're going going backwards. And some of the things that are happening in society horrifies me from the point of view of being a woman. Um, we don't need to look any further than America and, you know, look what's happening to, to women there in terms of, like, their right to choose is, is, is disappearing in a lot of the states. Yeah. Um, and you think that could never happen here. But actually, um, it definitely could. If you remember when Margaret Atwood wrote The Handmaid's Tale, she mm -hmm. said there's nothing in that book that's not happening somewhere in the world. Um, yeah. And I sometimes think that, that all these rights that we have, 
um, could disappear just as easily as they come. Um, and thank goodness for this book. So thank goodness and for this book. And it's up to the rest of us to keep yeah. it going, to, to keep the flame alive. Yeah, and not let it be something that we think is in the bag and done because mm -hmm. it's eroded. Even the, the I am clotter, the clotter. Clotter, for those of you who don't know, mm -hmm. is the goddess of the River Clyde. There's a wonderful long poem in here called I am clotter, and it's quite incredible. Um, looking at this goddess amongst the, the male workers and the ships and all the rest of it. So I wanted to go back to Sylvia Plath's maid. Um, obviously, you're very familiar with her work, so there's quite a lot of her life story, kind of tales from her life in here about mm -hmm. biting and drawing yeah. blood. What's the bit about the resolute black shoes, but all oh, the way you open doors into dreams would have shocked resolute black shoes? You tell I was basically that. comparing what the what Sylvia Plant's education must have been like with an Irish girl at school yes. being taught by nuns mm -hmm. and that very harsh way um, that some of them, you know, that were taught with, you know, like um, the the resolution of the nuns about being right about the about this, the the social strata being what they wanted it to be. Yeah. Um, and how hard that must have been to break away from it, as opposed to a liberal, wealthy American that, you know, that, that was born to write. Well, yeah. if she was born to write, does that mean the maid was born to clean? Yeah. yeah and I think when you, you, you know, when you read this poem and you see that, that um, you, it's quite interesting that you loved her poetry at one point, felt you could learn a lot about it. And then the fact that she couldn't afford an English maid. Mm. Is there somewhere where she says, that they worked harder as well. The Irish ones worked harder. Yeah, so the, the, you know, but for the Irish girl, you know, it would be working harder than, than oh, the English were used to being worked. Um, so that's what she was on the lookout for. Oh, that's quite off putting, I have to say. <laughs> that's extraordinarily like off putting. Um, um, that's yeah. when I immediately decided that I would have been, I would have been more likely to have been the Irish maid than the <laughs> the theatre poet. So I think as well, though, you give her that, you give her that real huge. I don't know whether it's libido or, you know, carnivore or whatever, you know, but she's like a panther in the wind pouring out love that no man or none can subdue. Was she taught by nuns or are you just making a reference to No, nuns? no, it was the maid that was taught by nuns. I was The, the maid in my imagination was taught by nuns. Sylvia Plath wasn't taught by nuns, so I think that she was, you know, able to be free. It was the 60s and she lived a 60s lifestyle, which, you know, like, which an Irish maid probably didn't. Would never um, have, yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, she did bite Ted Hughes on the cheek and drew blood the first time she met him. Um, and I thought, what would make somebody do that? <laughs> Imagine how confident you'd need to be in yourself to go up to somebody you'd never met and bite them on the cheek and draw blood. I'm not um, sure what confidence that I was. I mean, confident or quite mad. I mean, that is well, a, quite a crazy thing to do. But it um, is, yeah. It's not it's not routine. You don't routinely meet people that do that. No, definitely not. And um but I love it. I love the the way that you're comparing this genius with, you know, as you say, you're going back in and out of her life, uh, but the, the maid's life and the mm. social restriction and uh, the cleaning sinks and laundering the shirt. Uh, absolutely fabulous. Um so and it was quite unusual as well. I thought that because everybody writes things about you know Sylvia Plath, you know jumping off of her poetry and all that. So it was great that you found that. Uh, I don't think there'll be any other poems that I know certainly of Sylvia Plath's made, especially from a narrative. So well done you. But anyway, so I'm going to ask you to read us some more poetry now, Linda, and uh, I can sit back and enjoy. And um, so here, folks, we're going to welcome back Linda to read another couple of poems from Clotter. Okay, this one's um, Mind Maps, and this is really about what goes on in your head. Sometimes if you like to enter into your mind, what would you find there? And this is my bash at what might be inside my head. <laughs> Look in a mind and you will find beautifully laundered thoughts designed to glisten like polished crystal jewels inside the white bones of a skull washed clean by the sea and left to dry on the sand. Look further and you will see maps to guide getting around, self-help and reference books filled with facts and helpful suggestions, a file with extinction written in bold black letters. If you go there, 
You will find fossilised nightmares of children with rosary beads, eyes cast downcast, chanting. Women giving birth to dead babies alone. Men in suits, counting, counting and counting. Go back to the spotless, unblemished thoughts. Take them, take them, they were thought for you. They are as pure as the day they were created. Oh, okay. So that's really the state of my mind, and, you know, because I was um, taught to be a social constructionist. And so what's constructed in our heads and what, you know, like, and, and what is part of our own imagination that we've constructed for ourselves. You know, the eight with society basically. I, mean, I actually love the some of the images you got. I mean, the beginning of that, the first two uh, the first two stanzas seem to be there's a kind of undercurrent of looking for peace, you know, that the to get everything perfect, you know, like you'll find beautifully laundered thoughts and you go back to them at the very end. But mm. it, it, there's a kind of a feeling that the narrator is seeking some kind of quietude. And peace of her inner mind, you know, that the, the self help then comes up in reference books of facts and suggestions. And then at that point, it changes a file with extinction, and it's brutal that that third verse is the nightmare, fossilized nightmares of children with rosary beads, eyes downcast. It's as if the worst of the news is just flashed right up in your mind. Stories of horror, you know, and then. Of course, within this capitalist society, the men counting, counting, counting. And you feel as if the counting could be anything but including the dead babies, you know. Yeah. It's, it's all the horrors that it's a, but then and it's this kind of almost command tense, go back, don't stay with that, don't stay with that stuff. Yeah, it's absolutely yeah. beautiful. It's in, in the potential for human beings. To embrace the best that they can while acknowledging that other stuff's there, but don't stay with it. Yeah, move on. <laughs> well, if you can't do anything about it, yeah. But a friend of mine used to, you know, really torture herself with the things in the world of ill. And I said, well, really, you have to try and do something about it. If this is happening every day, that's all you can think about. The only thing you can do is try to do something about it. And if you're not able to, you have to think about something else, you know, mm. because there's no point in staying with these other things unless you're going to be an activist. And some of us now, maybe I think we've done that, you know, a little bit of it. It's maybe time just to try and find a wee bit of peace, I think, and let someone else do the other stuff, you know, in terms of, you know, letting yourself invest too much time in all the dark and the dark things that are going on in the world. Mm. Good. Fabulous, Linda. So can we hear um, your final poem? Um, which is Granny this, Park. This is kind of part of a series, isn't it? This was, I used to have conversations with my brother-in-law's auntie, um, who's in her 90s now, and she was a great storyteller. Um, and I used to ground and sit with her, with my sister, and she'd tell us these stories. Um, so I thought, oh, I really like the idea of like working class women that nobody really notices outside their family, but actually do make quite an impact on people that they come across just by being the people that they are. Um, so this is about... Um, and I think I, Scotland, Scotland's full of these women. Probably everywhere yeah, is, but we certainly we know them all over Scotland. You can go up to the islands and see women that, you know, there's there's boys, teenagers who get into trouble and people will, you need to go and see Nessie or whatever. And there's a woman in the village who is a kind of anti to everybody, you know, what, putting them back in the rails mm -hmm. and... Gift, gifting people with our time and and it's nothing special but it is yeah. right I'm going it's to nothing special on. you know because you wonder when that generation disappears you know like who are we going to be taking <laughs> you know that our guidance from um and hopefully they'll have passed on enough to us for us to be able to I take on that yeah no, they have we must believe they have okay right linda go right, this is granny parks outside it could have been the gloomiest and most bitter of nights, but Granny Park's kitchen rail range was full of her miner's coal. The griddle on top cooking soda scones, crisp golden shells breaking into soft white centres. 
Isaac abandons herself to the sensations and floats away on a memory of that happiness found in everyday humdrum. Sitting in Granny Park's kitchen, Isa did not want to be anything more than Isabella Gordon McGilvery. Feeling love as natural as breathing, listening to the stories, dissolving into one with Isa, Granny and those scones. This sense of completeness is what makes life worth living and the lucky accident that led Isabella Parks to be her granny. Oh, God. It's so warm and lovely. Did she hear that? Did you read that to her? I did, I said, um, yeah, she, she she read the poems that, I, I, that I'd written about them and, you know, that, and, she, and she liked them. She was like, I'm very pleased that they went into the book. Can I ask you to do one more? Because I love these poems. Sorry, it's a wee extra. And you'll never okay. have... Um, it's the one, the next one to that that's proper. So it's the other side of these family, this family. Oh yeah, the papa was um, Granny Granny Parks's um, papa. He was a miner, um, and I think and he was her. He was her grandfather. He was he was her grandfather, and he went into down the mines from a very young age. It probably says here somewhere, but in my mind, it's like as a child he went down the mines. Um, so that was quite common, apparently. Um, my, 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 I mean, it wasn't even as far back as that because my dad was a miner and his father was a miner out in Lanarkshire. But my father said he realised how worthless they were when they put the wee boys down the mines. He was 10. But with ponies, they had to have ponies with yeah. them as well. But they took the ponies up after a particular number of hours because they were more valuable, but they left the children down for a double shift. Left the children down there. Uh -huh. So the children could do double shift to the ponies good because the ponies were more valuable to the, yeah. the men that owned the mines. That's my father. That's my father. I mean, it's not yeah, that. Yeah, it's he went down the mines. I think I, I, that that sounds a bit right about the age of nine or ten. And um, he had a big scar down his face that he'd got then as well. You know, like from being down the mine. And you think, God, nowadays, you know, like people would be taken to court for that kind of accident to happen to a child. You know, but. Yeah, and my his father, my grandfather Matthew, he used to um tell me well, didn't tell me because he he died when I, apparently he, he used to take me walking for the hours in the park in my pram and I would just be happy with him. But I vaguely remember him now because like, I I must have been three or four when he died. But I hear lots of stories that when he was a young man, they used to just get their Davy lamps on, get all ready, get up at my granny would be up at four, getting his pieces and all the rest of it, and they would head up to the colliery. And the guy, the gaffer, would stand and say, "Well, to you, you and you the day," and the rest mm. would have to go home. And that was how they—that was their job. Their job was to go there and see if they had any chance. Or get, they didn't get paid for getting up at four in the morning and standing about seeing if they were picked. And it was completely ad hoc. Um, I mean, he would get a turn and obviously go down, but some days there was maybe less coal, and so they would say, "Well, you all have to go home today." And it was, I remember thinking, hearing about that, how how vulnerable lifestyle is that you don't even know if we're if going back to that children... Melinda. we're going back to that with the gig economy you know like a lot of a lot of our big cities you know like when a lot of the building work that's going on the 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 the, the, the laboring lot that they turn yeah. up to see if there's a job for them um and if there is they get taken on and, there's, and if there's no then they go and that's it's it just, God, all these years of unionism and we're back to this Mm -hmm. And maybe, um, we've never, maybe we've never been completely away from it. It's maybe just getting bigger again by the yeah. downturn in the economy. Anyway, yeah, so please let us hear Popper because I always think of my own mine and family yeah. when I read this. Popper. Popper sits sitting tea, sipping tea, cold chiselled into the creases of his face. He does not tell Isa things were better in the old days. Those days were dark and colourless. The past is a story, he tells Isa, held in mind only by what you think you felt then. Papa listens to Isa read, makes her toast and gives her strip it minty sweets from his pocket. He looks at her wistfully. She is a source of mystery and wonder to him. His face was rough, his hands hard and his tall body stooped. Even his spittle was black. In Papa's black and grey world, his family brought colour. 
Isa closes her eyes. She smells his jacket and his black tobacco, hears his voice, fine tuned to the sound of coal dust, with lungs that blew like bagpipes. Somewhere in Isa, the memory of holding Papa's hand roots her to a sense of well-being. The warmth in Papa's heart, sitting in his chair, pipe in one hand, a glass in the other, glowing with unconditional love. No, Papa did not mourn the past. His memory was not strong enough for that. Yet he contradicted notions that life was painful and meaningless. Isa knew joy in this simple relationship. Those ties are woven into the fabric of who she is, creating a bright and vibrant family dye that colours Isa's life with happiness. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful poem. I mean, really, and it's just, it's a beautiful poem representing the warmth of family mm -hmm. life. I mean, we have just stated the horrors of poverty and, and obviously the pauper isn't romanticising. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like sitting by the coothy fire, mm -hmm. freezing, trying to get a heat, but love shines out all. We all know that's nonsense. But the fact is love was there within this abject poverty actually mm -hmm. with the limitations um sometimes i mean i don't know i would hate to go there in cases but sometimes you wonder if excess in general is it possible that ex excess can lead to um more of um selfish indulgence i don't know you know or where uh, families having more need to cleave together to stay alive, literally, and to stay warm. I mean, that generation lost siblings like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they all had much more kids than ever survived. So these things, these horrors, you wonder if if it's that kind of thing that grows the love and the connections, you know, that they need to have. I don't, I don't really know. Because it worries me that these, these kind of things may invoke a sense of, the romanticism of being impoverished, you know what I mean? That it's gonna. I think that generation to that. to the future generation and wanted them to have what they thought would be a better life, yeah. and a better life for them was the ability to pay bills, go the odd holiday, and that it wasn't. They never really thought about finding themselves, or you know, like, or the, there's a sense of entitlement. And a lot of the generations after after that, that people don't just want to pay their bills or want to go on holiday, they feel entitled to be able to do these things. And that's not a bad entitlement, but then it spills over onto all sorts of frippery. People spend a lot of money on things that they don't actually need. Um, and have been encouraged know. to do so over, yeah. I mean, it really got tight on it when, I mean, there's a book, Gillian Beer Still Crazy After All These Years, and it looks at, the spending of post-war women, which was frantic, you know, and it was cigarettes in the movies, movie stars, that whole Hollywood thing was the big push for capitalist consumerist spending in women, you know, and the, the cigarettes and the holders, that gave women that sense of freedom and independence, obviously women having their own money and being able to earn money, but they were given where the money was to go and where it was to be spent. And there's a fabulous anthropology book looking at that, called Still Crazy After All These Years. And it's women who bought and bought and bought. They couldn't stop buying, you know, that generation of women because they had it. They, they had, I mean, they didn't have lots of money, but they obviously could see a huge quantifiable difference between what their mothers and fathers had had in the 20s and 30s from what they had post-war, with the post-war boom, you know. So they just apparently... And it's quite common. You can speak to like friends of mine, their parents... My own mum died a few years ago and their parents it was the same kind of age group. And they would say, you know, we found like seven types, seven colours of the same shirt, shoes still in boxes, bales of towels. You know, it wasn't because they just couldn't stop. They just kept buying things, you know. And I think it's quite interesting to look at that and then look at where we are now. Um, and... I think there's less of that, but I think things are now much, much more expensive and people still, you know, I, I worry about the, the consumerism that we're 
surrounded by, you know, really do worry about that. Um, but anyway, so we could talk lots. Uh, this is there's a thing I, about gene raffinations. I'm just going to read this wee bit about Gene Rafferty. It's written, Linda Devlin is a poet who is not content with staying on the surface. She probes deep, deep beneath, trying to define the nature of reality and the many shades of sorrow, culminating in the white tip of an iceberg, the different thoughts mapped out in her mind. A poet whose thoughts, as in her own words, come bursting out from all one boundaries. And I would say that's true. Morag Anderson, fabulous poet who's writing... Hi, just now, she says, Linda Devlin's quarter is a bold rush at the world, like the collection's namesake, goddess of the River Clyde, a mirror ball reflecting numerous versions of ourselves and the spaces we occupy. This collection invites the reader to look closer, question those laundered thoughts, and admit the dark truths of damaged, received, or delivered. There is an undeniable fragility, but like the river, currents of strength, run deep and fast and renewals all I can do to add my fragment to the whole lingers long after you've finished reading. Two fabulous testaments from well-established writers so well done Linda Devlin. If you've not read this book or got a hold of it and if you get a chance you should come along on Sunday to Scottish Pen Sunday at um, the Mount Florida Bookshop in Cathcart Road. It's a small bookshop, small independent bookshop. I'll be reading there and I'll be introducing Linda at that. So if you've got any time on Sunday at five o'clock, Cathcart Road, we we'll hope to see you there and Linda and I will be there reading. Thank you very much, Linda Devlin. Thanks for writing these wonderful poems. And thank you, Linda Jackson, for putting it all together. <laughs> so I'll yeah. see you see you on Sunday. We'll have a wee glass of wine, okay? Okay. Bye. In my bag. I'll have it in my bag. They don't have any there. Right, I'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye bye now. Bye.